Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Ketamine Clinics of Los Angeles for our weekly 3 p.m. live stream on Facebook. I have to tell you again, I'm late and I'm sorry. And I've just had to do some clinical work that took, that intruded on our time. And that does come first. I'm sitting in my clinic in one of our infusion chairs. And I have to tell you, I don't get to sit in them very often. They are comfortable. I like it. And I'm looking out at the Pacific Ocean and Catalina Island, and it's really kind of nice here. But that's not why you tuned in. The um, question that came up recently was, hey, this is so exciting. This works so well for people. When is it going to be FDA approved? Well, it probably isn't going to be FDA approved. FDA approval is given to a drug pursuant to an application that demonstrates its safety and its efficacy for a particular population, for a particular indication or purpose given by a particular route of administration and a particular quantity. So if I find a great drug, for example, for treating blood pressure, and it works great to treat blood pressure, and I get approval, and I sell it for controlling people's blood pressure. And some guy finds that it also makes hair grow. This happened a few years ago with a drug, the trade name of which is Rogaine. It's actually illegal for the company that makes that drug to promote it for the purpose of growing hair. It was approved for blood pressure control and it can only be sold and promoted for blood pressure control. If they want to sell it for hair growth, they need to actually design a new study and make another new drug application for that purpose. This is a many million dollar process. The hoops that one has to jump through to get approval are legion. It's unfortunate. It's maybe designed to protect the public, maybe designed to keep the club of those who come up with new drugs very small. In any event, it's a game where only a few big players work. And they are not interested in spending money on an orphan, out of patent drug, which is cheap and ubiquitous. They can never get their money back. In fact, the drug companies don't want people to use ketamine. Ketamine's not their baby. They want them to use the newest, latest, greatest, most expensive new antidepressant. Ketamine works better than all the existing antidepressants. And some people say, oh, but we don't know the side effects. Well, all those antidepressants were invented, or synthesized in the 80s and 90s, a few in the 2000s. Ketamine was synthesized in 1962. It's been used since 1970. So we have at least as much experience with ketamine as we do with any of those agents. People will say, oh, but we don't know what the long-term side effects are. That's true, we don't. Although we have hundreds of millions of administrations because ketamine is the most widely used anesthetic in the world. Yeah, I was just going to mention, if I might chime in, Dr. Mandel, that uh, ketamine has been used on a much larger population than any of those antidepressants. For a much longer period. That's yeah. quite correct. So although the, this treatment being, uh, this, this purpose, this use for it being relatively new, uh, the, the drug itself has been used um, for a very long time and in much larger doses without any apparent long-term side effects, correct? That is correct, yes. So, Big Pharma really doesn't want to see ketamine used therapeutically. The insurance companies don't want to see ketamine accepted for this indication because if it is accepted, they have very little justification to not pay for it. Right now they can say, it's an off-label use. We don't pay for off-label uses. Or they can say, oh, we think that's experimental. We don't pay for experimental treatments. That sounds good. It's a nice justification to not write the check. Insurance companies exist primarily to aggregate money. They're not in the business of taking care of you. 
They're in the business of pooling your money, all of our money, into huge pools that they can then loan at interest. That's what insurance companies do. The obligation to write a check to a subscriber is one they are reluctant to fulfill. They don't do it unless they have to. Researchers are very leery of a drug getting into widely use, wide use because it threatens their ability to continue to get grants to study it. It also exposes the drug to the possibility of notoriety or ridicule, which really disrupts their studies. Psychiatrists have a model, or most psychiatrists in the United States have a model of chronicity. You come in quarterly, they review your situation, they renew your prescriptions, and off you go. Ketamine is not a drug you take every day forever. It's a drug you take episodically. And if it works for you, and it does work for over 80% of our patients, you don't need to come back for a while, maybe a long while, maybe a short while, not a predictable while. It's not a great model for planning a steady stream of patient visits. Now, I'm not talking all psychiatrists here. and There are some very courageous psychiatrists using ketamine and using it well and getting great results. But establishment psychiatry has really glommed on to this chronicity model. This is disruptive for them. So they really want to discourage it. The latest wrinkle is to talk about ketamine. Oh yeah, it does work. And, but it doesn't work long. And now we're beginning to show data that it does work for a long time. So now they say, oh, but how about the bladder issues? Well, I want to put that to rest. Large doses of ketamine among abusers for years, and when I say large doses, I mean doses on the order of 10 to 100 times what we give therapeutically. Those large doses for literally years are causing somewhere between 20 and 50 percent. We don't know exactly how many because we don't know how many abuses there are because they don't like to come forward. But somewhere between 20 and 50 percent of those people do develop bladder or kidney problems, some urinary tract problem. Now I know we, we touched a little bit on that last week uh, as well as uh, addiction potential and, and I would ask others to maybe take a quick look at that video if they want to look more into that. But I had a quick question, if you don't mind, about what you were saying with insurance companies. Do you think that if they uh, were to start paying for ketamine, they might realize that there's some opportunity to save money with that? That in actuality, in comparison to many of the other treatments that are FDA approved and that they are paying for, um, be it you know ECT, TMS, or just other ongoing uh, medications and therapies, they might actually find when they run the numbers, ketamine could potentially save them money. Since you eloquently stated they are, you know, un you know, unfortunately, mostly focused on money. Actually, Sam, that's a very interesting question, uh, and some insurance companies are actually looking at that. One insurer, the Kaiser Foundation of Northern California has found ketamine so effective that they've actually opened ketamine clinics. They now have six of them. And they have found that to be very cost effective compared to alternatives for treating the depressed patients among their subscriber population. And that's a huge institution. It is. And not always, with all due respect to them, the most progressive. Kaiser is not an early adopter of anything. They really want to see the proof that it works and they want to see the proof that it's cost effective. Right, and both totally you know, valid points. For a health maintenance organization, that's a responsible position. And that's the position they've taken. And despite coming from that perspective, they are opening ketamine infusion clinics. They're also beginning to institute a program of oral administration of ketamine. We're going to have to see what the data shows about that. The only administration for which there is substantial data is intravenous administration. The other routes may be very effective in some settings, but there isn't any data. I know of one study about intranasal 
and the effectiveness was in the low 40% range as opposed to intravenous, which is in the, depending on which studies you read, in the 70 to 80% range. So that's where we are with ketamine, the off-label use of ketamine. Remember, one out of five prescriptions, actually more than one out of five, something like 21% of all prescriptions written in the United States are written for off-label uses. Ketamine is not disapproved by anyone, well, anyone responsible. <laughs> it is approved for use as an anesthetic by the FDA. This is an off-label use. It's not in violation of anything. Right, I think that's a very important uh, distinction for people. Um, one other thing I, I want to touch on, and I know you don't have a lot more time, but since you mentioned other routes of administration, um, I know for some patients you prescribe ketamine lozenges. And it might be uh, useful for some of our viewers to understand your, your thinking behind that with the uh, fact that IV really is the gold standard and the most effective? That's a really good point. We have used ketamine lozenges for about a year now. We have about 60 odd patients on ketamine lozenges. They're for a particular group. Ketamine lozenges, in my hands at least, do not seem to be able to lift people's depression. We have a group of people who have really robust responses to intravenous ketamine, but the response is short-lived. Our patients typically get about three months, three and a half months of relief. Some patients get over a year. We have many patients out many months. We have some patients who will get a really good response, but it only lasts five weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. We suggest those patients have boosters two, and then go on lozenges. And what do the lozenges do? Well, they can't do the heavy lifting of relieving an established depression, but they're really good at sustaining the benefit already achieved by an intravenous infusion. In fact, I liken ketamine lozenges to what we used to call hamburger helper for extending the benefits of a hamburger. It's just as palatable and it makes for a great deal more on the table. Thank you very much, Dr. Mandel. Is there anything else you wanted to add before we go? And I know you still have some patients to, uh, to go see before you start your weekend. I'm starting to get a little relaxed in front of the camera. I really like the fact that you people tune in. I hope that I'm giving you useful information and I wish you would communicate back with me. It will sharpen my focus and enable me be more responsive to what you'd like to hear about. Until next week at 3 p.m., remember daylight saving time next week. I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you very much, Dr. Mandel, and I hope all of our, our viewers have a really great weekend.